Let's turn to Philippians chapter 1 um, and uh, just highlight a couple of things. Um, <clears throat> this won't be, won't be long this evening, but um, the last couple Saturdays we've been talking about faith, having faith, having great faith, having strong faith. Um, last Saturday, we looked at the exemplar of faith in the Scripture, in Paul's writings, as he drew from uh, the father of faith and presented the, literally the, t the type of strong faith that Abraham had, how Abraham was a person who was given a promise. And Abraham, as it describes what true strong faith is like, Abraham could literally look at an impossibility, look at something that, that, that screamed no, no chance of happening and a promise of God that accompanied that. But yet he, in facing the fact that there was impossible circumstances that were, that were trying to compete with God's, God's declared promise, he didn't dwell on it. He didn't get lost in it, but instead he looked at God and was captured by the presence of God and a revelation exploding in his heart that God is a God who gives life to the dead and calls those things which are not as though they were. And thus, against hope, in hope, Abraham believed, and he became fully convinced that God was able to perform what he had promised. Now, that's strong faith. That's Hebrews 11 faith. But tonight, I want to I wanna take it a little bit different direction in that I want to, one of the evidences in our life that we're living, we're living in true faith is that something begins to happen to us. And it begins from the moment we get out of bed in the morning until we go to bed at night. And it's an attitude that we begin to embody and it's an attitude that, that gives us buoyancy. It, it uplifts us. Um, in my studies in, uh, in organizational science, one of the things that, that, that you discover about people who have a real positive attitude is that people who have a really positive attitude, um, there, it has an elevating effect, an uplifting effect. You, it just kind of, it kind of lifts your soul. And when you're around people who are positive, who have a positive attitude, they, they, they lift, they kind of carry you up higher with them. That you just, it's almost like it's contagious. They call it emotional contagion. A positive emotional contagion that, that when you have people who are positive in a workplace, they actually will pass on that emotional positivity to others, that positive attitude. And there are certain ones within an organization that will be called what are called positive energizers. You just get around them. It's like, it's like here, here at Ventura County Christian School, we have a central processing unit positive energizer named Tanya Goya. Right? I mean, she's just, she's just it, we all have our moments. Right? We all have our moments. But, but she's, she's a positive energizer. She could light up a room if she was totally depressed. <laughs> That's right. Tanya could light up a room if she was totally depressed. You know? She's just, you know, there's people that are like that. And you get around them. And when, when you're with them, something, something happens. You, you actually feel that same elevating or uplifting effect in your own, in your own heart. Well, I believe one of the, the best evidences of, of real faith is people who live expectantly. There's just that, that buoyancy on the level of their soul that they're expecting something to happen. I went to Oral Roberts University for my first of many post-high school educational experiences, Oral Roberts University. And of course, can anybody remember the two famous phrases that Oral Roberts um, popularized? What? Expect a miracle and something good is going to happen to you today. That was, that was Oral Roberts University. It was, it was just, that was Oral Roberts. It's just the con that constant faith, that constant expect a miracle. Something good is going to happen to you today. Now think about it for a minute. If we could live like that, if we could live that expectantly, with that buoyancy and that positive attitude um, going into this new year, what God might possibly do. Now, I, I'm, I'm always amazed at the Apostle Paul 
in so many of his writings, he, he, really, he really exemplified this through his writings, how he maintained that, that faith that was more of an expectant kind of victorious, I'm ready for something good to happen. Um, some of these are, these are going to be on the, um, on, in, in the scripture. Let me, let me put them up here on the, yeah. I'm going to get there. Okay. There we go. Okay. I'll put them up there, but, there, but if you turn to Philippians, they're in the text as well. So Paul begins his letter to the Philippian church, and he's thanking them upon every remembrance. He's praying for them. But right away, Paul just releases this exuberance. Just feel the attitude in, in some of these declarations. Paul says, I am confident that the good work, he who began a good work in you, is going to carry it on to completion um, until the day of Christ, until Christ returns. Positive, very confident. You can, you can just feel this, and I want this just to resonate with us tonight, that this, this would be the faith, this would be the living, active, expectant faith that we would take into the new year where we would literally be on the edge of our seat ready for God to do something this year. And to live that way, not just in a moment, but to get up in the morning with that, that sense of, wow, what is God going to do today? Think of what would happen if we had that level of, I mean, we've talked about the strong faith, the anchor of the soul type faith in the last couple of Saturdays, the, 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 uh, the believing for a promise in the face of an impossibility. And I encouraged you last Saturday to um, identify a big rock going to Bill Johnson's story, if you, were, if, you, if you missed it last Saturday, of how when his dad had become sick um, and Bill Johnson and the entire church were praying for Bill, for, for his father to, to be healed. Um, and, and after several weeks, months passed, he passed away. And Bill, Bill Johnson describes later how it was like he was, he was believing, praying for this 500-pound boulder to move, and it didn't budge an inch. But after that experience, he then began to pray for some other things that he felt were more like 50-pound boulders, boom, and God immediately moved. Because even though the 500-pound boulder had not moved, it strengthened his faith to the point by believing for that, that healing of his father, even though that did not come to pass, it strengthened his faith to the point that other things that he had not yet begun to experience an anointing in began to happen as he prayed. Sometimes... An answer, to the, 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 uh, an answer to prayer that doesn't happen can be as powerful as an answer to prayer that does because of what it does inside of us, what it shapes inside of us. So we've talked about that kind of faith, but now, now I want to talk about the faith that's effervescent, the faith that, that grabs your heart and mind and emotions and attitude, and that, and that is exuding something that's going to become contagious and influential in other people's lives, that they get pulled into that sense of expectancy and excitement. You, you, feel, you feel this through Paul. Now, Paul then goes on in Philippians chapter 1, verse 12, to start talking about his imprisonment. He's in chains as, as he's writing or probably speaking these words to somebody else who's writing them, and he's talking about his chains being in Christ, and it's basically as fast as the, the, the guards were chained to Paul, he probably led them to Jesus. And uh, that's where he'll say eventually here that it's become known throughout the entire imperial guard, verse 13, um, that my imprisonment is in Christ. But Paul, in the midst of prison, declares, now I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that what has happened to me has actually served to advance the gospel, his imprisonment. He has a positive attitude about being in prison. And you can read that throughout this, this, um, th this chapter. Um, uh, he, he, does, he does express that because of their prayer, his, this, this positive attitude is also ex expressing itself in terms of a of belief that he will be delivered. Yes, I will continue to rejoice, for I know that through your prayers and God's provision of the Spirit of Christ Jesus, what has happened to me will turn out for my deliverance. So there is, a, there is an expectation of something good happening, but he's excited that people are coming to Christ 
in prison, even by those who are preaching to compete with Paul, who are doing it, verse 17 says, out of selfish ambition, hoping to, um, you know, kind of add to Paul's burden in prison. Paul's excited people are hearing about Jesus. You can just feel the enthusiasm of Paul in a, in a really difficult situation. Um, and then Philippians 1.20 is such a powerful verse. I've learned it from the, the New King James Version where Paul says, here's kind of the bottom line of, of, what, of this expectant type of faith. According to my earnest expectation and hope that in nothing I will be ashamed, but that now, as always, Christ will be magnified. I would have sufficient courage that now, as always, Christ would be magnified or exalted in my body, whether by life or by death. Um, the, that, that Greek word, that's, it's, a, it's a single word that translates the, the phrase eagerly expect and hope. Um, I, I, Joey showed me this last week. Uh, where is it again? Oh, the button. There it is. There. Apo, apokera dokia is the Greek word that's translated expectation and hope, or I eagerly, I eagerly expect and hope. And it, it's a word that, that uh, the, it's a compound word that's, that's comprised of a Greek um, preposition from. Kera, the word for the head, in Greek, and then a verb, dokeo, to, to look intently, to kind of look, look down, kind of trying to spot, like trying to, trying to spot somebody in the crowd. And this, this word, it's, it's kind of like a visual description of like, you know, it's like you're at Disneyland, and it's a crowd of people, or you're at a sports event, and it's a crowd of people, and you're trying to spot somebody, so you kind of stand up, and you're just trying to get a, your head above the, above the crowd so you can spot that one person that you want, want to see um, that, that's up ahead. Well, that's what Paul is d- describing here. It's, it's, it's almost like st- somebody standing on their tiptoes trying to capture a glimpse of, of something, something up ahead. So my wife and I, I don't know where we came across this, must have been Facebook, sweetheart, but you remember when we came across this new word? So I've got a new vocabulary word. Let's increase our word vocabulary every day. You can read or side yes. You know. Anyway, um, so we're going to learn a new word tonight, and you're going to you're going to use this word. This year, my word, my prophetic word. This is how I give a prophetic word for New Year. I'm not not always in the pastors who give all the. But my word is a tiptoe. That's your word for the year. A tiptoe. Okay, a tiptoe. It's a word. Yeah, a tiptoe. And a tiptoe. If you look it up in the dictionary, a tiptoe means to stand in one's tiptoes. <laughs> One, on the tip of one's toes, okay, or in a state of expectancy, as in anticipating a desired event, and I think it continues, or arrival, a tiptoe. So I want us to learn, I want, I will make this confession, um, I want to learn how to live in the Spirit a tiptoe. That's what I. That's 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 my heart's desire. I want a faith that's 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 exuberant, more exuberant, more expected. I want to go back to my Oral Roberts University roots and expect a miracle every day and believe that something good is going to happen to me today. Because I think if we could capture that, if we could get to that point where we're just not down in the dumps, you know. But but we're, 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 there's a buoyancy there in the spirit that, that I believe, for some of us, <laughs> it's going to require God's grace. Um, I know for me it does, but, but, th- that, but grace is God doing what we cannot do, so we, we depend upon grace. We have to have grace. But that there would be a spiritual empowerment to live a tiptoe in the spirit. Uh, on, 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 on the tip of our toes, just kind of like, I'm waiting for it. I'm looking for it. God's going to do something today. I don't know what. He's going to speak something to me. He's going to reveal something to me. He's going to show someone to me. And I'm going to respond, living in the Spirit, a tiptoe. Okay? That's, what I, that's my challenge. That's my, my um, loving encouragement for us today. Now, I'm not sure why I I put this up here, but I, I thought maybe this is not living a tiptoe, but, but um, I just couldn't, couldn't, couldn't resist here. Um, 
it's a little hard to see. It's my, uh, anyway, that's my St. Bernard um, doing what he does best. That's, he's sleeping in a chair, okay? That, that's, well, that's my chair. That's actually my chair, but, but um, we compete for it. We compete for it. Um, and uh, so I will get in the chair. If I beat him to it, then he crawls up into my lap. Um, and he will sit on my lap in the chair. Yeah, until, that's right. And well, I, I, I can't go anywhere if Leo's sitting, sitting in my lap. You're, you're pretty much, you're stuck. On a 150 pound dog crawls up in your lap, you're not, you're not going anywhere, Lisa. <laughs> yes, uh, yes, absolutely. Say, please, please, say, do, you, do you know it in the... Um, I put it to song years oh, ago. Oh, please, oh, Lisa, sing that, sing that over. Okay. Yeah. And teach you, yeah. Okay, I'll try. <laughs> um, according to my persistent expectation and hope, is the Amplified, I will not be put to shame by anything, anything. I will live in free and fearless confidence always. I will live in free and fearless confidence always. I press, oh sorry, <laughs> I press on toward the upward calling Christ. Never looking back, I press on, I press on toward the prize. I press on. Toward the upward calling Christ, never looking back, I press on, I press on toward the prize. So I put two scriptures together, but because I felt like it went. Yeah. Um, but the first part, according to my persistent expectation and hope, I will not be put to shame by anything, anything. I will live in free and fearless confidence always. Repeat that line. I will live in free and fearless confidence always. Yeah, we'll just leave it at that. Oh, I press on toward the upward calling Christ. Never looking back, I press on, I press on toward the prize. I press on toward the upward calling Christ. Never looking back, I press on, I press on toward the prize. That is an incredible song, Lisa. Yeah. Did, you, did you come up with that song or write that kind of spontaneously? Yeah. Sounds like one of those, like, in the, in the middle of worship, you just get it and you sing it or something. Yeah. Well, in my living room. In your living room. As I was meditating on the scripture, and wow. then it just started coming in song. And wow. You put lots of scripture to music. I have. Tell us for us to all learn everything scripture. Yes. It is a good way. Yeah. I do need to make one. God's been wanting me to for years. Yeah. And Lisa, this one, please sing it again in the future as you're here. I mean, just sing, sing this song over us this year and any others that, that you have that you feel would be pertinent. Because like I said, your worship is so, even, even when you're singing familiar songs, your worship, your worship is so prophetic. Yeah, yeah. You're, 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 you're leading us into worship, but, you're, you're, but then you're speaking over us God's heart from that place of his presence yeah. okay. as you let us into his presence. Yeah, because his word has been everything to me since I got born again. I read the New Testament four times in four months when I first got born again, and the Holy Spirit himself was teaching me and showing me so much, and the word has just been my strength. He's, and that's where the prophetic flows from. When you really know the word, you have the truth in you. It can flow out of you. So, and I need to get back to the word because I've been in a dry season where I haven't been putting it in me as much but I'm thankful for the scriptures that were already in me and those songs that I did years ago because they've kept me going they've kept me in the faith yeah you know just I think to why it's she's so prophetic because she's intimate and, and that intimacy, we hear that intimacy, and it comes across as prophetic to us. 
Well, there's no, there's no performance with you, Lisa. I can always tell when someone who leads worship is just simply letting us kind of capture the overflow of their, their private experience of worship. You're not just coming to project or perform. You're coming to just do what you do with other people present is almost what it feels like sometimes. So that's really cool. And so, Lord, we just speak over Lisa right now as she goes into this new year, a whole new connection with you through the word that, Lord, she's, she's, she's with you, Lord, and she's singing these songs that you're giving her. Lord, we pray that just goes to a whole new level in the spirit this year. As, though, as Paul says in Colossians 3, letting, let the word dwell in her richly. And let the jewels of the word, let the treasure and value and worth of Jesus in the word flow forth in in and through her songs this year. Let the word would just explode in a new way as she would be released in a whole new dynamic. And Lord, here at Springs of Life, other places she leads worship, just let those new songs come forth. That just because, Lord, those are so prophetic and so powerful because she's prophesying. She's releasing, not just leading a song service, she's releasing. Sing God's heart and, and purpose over us as she leads. And Lord, let that go to a whole new level this year in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Good stuff. Good stuff. And so Paul continues, and in Philippians, of course, probably a culminating point of Paul just expressing to us this this buoyancy in his spirit, this, this positive attitude of expectant faith, according to my earnest expectation. That's how, that's what Paul, that's how Paul lived. I think then that leads one to always be looking forward. The apple caradokia thing, you're on, you're a tiptoe, always looking for the new thing, the next thing that God's doing. That doesn't mean we're not learning or capturing the moments um, that, that we walk through, but just like what was shared tonight by David and my wife, those are things we learn from, like, wow, the testimony of that just releases something. But, but Paul, for Paul, the continual uh, thrust of his heart was, but one thing I do. I wish I could say one thing I do, you know. The myriad things I get lost in, the one thing I do, forgetting what is behind, and straining, we know the imagery here of the runner trying to break the tape at the, the, the finish line. The one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead, I press on towards the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. And that's a whole study in itself, what that calling means and what that looks like. Uh, if you ever want to pick up a good book to understand the nature of calling, Os Guinness, The Call, is a great book. He helps to help helps to to paint that picture of our first calling. The priority of calling is simply to know Jesus personally and intimately. In in that book, he establishes that as the the the, the real the key to calling, and everything else kind of flows out of that. But Oskin is Oskin is the call. So what I, what I want to do here in just a couple minutes that I have left um, is I want to simply very quickly, and this won't take long, but I want to give you a a quick. Um, how do we move? So how do we how do we do this? How do we transition from from more of a negative perspective? Okay, where life looks pretty sour. Um, I came across a, a Facebook quote today. What was it, sweetheart? Um, you know, negative thoughts simply make difficult situations more difficult. Um, do you remember the rest of it? Um, uh, I can't I can't remember it now. But it was a you know, but, but, but um, yes. Psalms 50, verse 23. Psalms 50, verse 23. Someone have Psalms 50, verse 23 right in front of them? Let's look at Psalms 50, verse 23. Okay, Psalms 50, verse 23. The one who offers thanksgiving at his sacrifices glorifies me. To one who orders his way rightly, I will show the salvation of God. That's a good verse. Yeah. That's, that, that's, um, that's what helps me to be inspired. Oh. So it's that's good. Even if it feels like you're really pushing it out, it's just the thing that's right. He, he will make a way because his salvation is great. For you. That's good. That's really good. Yeah. Hey, right, right, on, right on the mark. Well, of course... You know, I don't have Del Esprit to pick on, but I got to show you a diagram here real quick. 
there's got to be a diagram in this somewhere. So, okay, so very quick. This is not going to be long. Looks like a whole teaching, but um, so Paul here is talking about this really, really, really. This is a very powerful verse that I've probably shared before, but he's talking about this this experience he had in Asia, probably at Ephesus. It's probably like like Acts nineteen twenty when when uh, he was um, under being persecuted and they they started shouting for like two hours. Great is the goddess of the uh, Artemis uh, of, of the Ephesians, you know, and we're shouting Paul down, and he might be referring to that, but he describes this terrible, soul-crushing experience that he had, where you can feel, you can feel the angst and the, the burden upon Paul. We were under great pressure, far beyond our ability to endure, so that we despaired of life itself. So if you kind of go to the top of the diagram here, kind of the tip of the iceberg, if you will, kind of, this is the, the attitude, this kind of what is above the soul. This is what you can quickly observe in people, our responses, uh, how we react to situations, the emotions that we carry, whether, whether there's that exuberance that I'm talking about or not. So Paul's talking about a moment when he was despairing of life. And in verse 9, in his heart, he even felt a sentence of death. So he's talking about this feeling of great burden, great heartache, great sense of despair, and, and things being, being really done. I mean, Paul is at a point of great, great desperate sense here of, 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 of what's happening in this moment. But, but then if you, I don't have all the text up here, but if you look, if you look in verse 10 of this passage, he, he goes on, though, and, and he will describe, he will describe in, in, in his... Um, uh, in his discussion of this experience, going back here to Second Corinthians real quick, he describes, though, this progression in verse 10 and following, he's delivered us from such a deadly peril. He will deliver us. On him we have set our hope that he will deliver us again. And he goes on to talk about through their prayer, he's offering thanksgiving on their behalf for the blessing that is coming to both him and the church. So Paul ends this, this passage with this great expression of exuberance regarding how he is expectant that God is going to do something incredible in his life and will continue to do so. One, because they're praying for him, but because, two of what he's experienced and knows of his God. So how did Paul, in his attitude, how did he make this transition from a sentence of death and despair over to this exuberant expression of, wow, I'm so excited what God's going to do. He's delivering us, and he will continue to deliver us. Wow, that God is awesome. How do, how do you get from the left side in your attitudinal posture to the right side, okay? And as we know, your, your attitude determines your altitude. That's right. Your attitude determines your altitude. So how do we, how do we transition from real feelings that are not very positive, negative, to a positive? Well, I believe that attitudes, although they're more the surface of life, okay? Below that, though, is what we've been talking about. It's, it's our faith. You see, Paul expressed something about his God that made all the difference. He said, this happened that we might not rely on ourselves on God, but not just some ethereal concept, but God who raises the dead. You see, Paul, just like Abraham last week, Paul's attitude, the buoyancy, the tip of the iceberg, this has an iceberg in it. Let me show you the iceberg here real quick, okay? Looks like an iceberg. Okay, so the attitudes, what people see, how we respond to situations in our life, uh, wh whether we're showing that sense of buoyancy and expectancy or not, it, that's what's above the surface, but that's only going, you can only live that way for so long, and you're going to crash and burn. It's like, a, you know, a coffee, you know, drinking, you know, go ahead and have that three-shot espresso drink, and you'll, you, for about three hours, you'll be, you'll be happy but then wait till the crash comes, you know. I watch that with the kids who have sugar here. Julie knows all about the, the sugar highs. Um, and then the kids, then they, then they crash, you know, then they, after the sugar high. Well, the, 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 the top surface is only going to stay there relative to what's, what's, what's underneath, okay? So what's underneath with Paul was first beliefs, God who raises the dead. Okay, that's his faith. That was his faith, his beliefs. But um, 
what, what psychology tells is that even your beliefs, what you believe, things you believe, is not the, um, is not the, the deepest part of your, of your soul. Okay, psychology is, is continually actually getting very close to describing what we would call godly character. Whether it's godly or not, it's still character, okay? In other words, you can believe that honesty is the best policy, but here's the question of, of worldview, of values. Are you honest? There's a difference between believing that honesty is the best policy and being honest, okay? So our values, our worldview at the bottom, the bottom, the deeper part and the, the greater part of our life is this what they call deep structure where, where our worldview um, is, is embodied and, and where we, we, we live out of this. We live out of this, this deep sense of what's been shaped uh, in, in, in the character of our lives, in the deep structure of our lives, that honestly only gets shaped by two factors. Hardship, generally, trouble, things that we go through that are difficult. That's why James says, count it all joy when you go through, when you go through, you know, Baskin Robbins, 31 flavors of troubles. Um, get excited about all those trials that are coming your way because, because th it's going to work perseverance and let perseverance have its work because they're going to be perfect and entire, not lacking anything, James chapter 1 says. So, so it, it, you know, this, we go through trouble uh, of all sorts, pressure, things that happen to us, and the Holy Spirit meets us in those places and character begins to form, Okay. Paul in Romans 5 talks about, you know, a tribulation produces perseverance, and perseverance produces character. But what, how does, what's the next part? Hope. Character produces hope. I always thought character was the ultimate. Give me Oswald Chambers, and I'm good enough. Give me, give me Dietrich Bonhoeffer, Christ. When Christ calls a man, he bids him come and die. That's it. That's the ultimate goal. You know it's not? Until that character can release in hope, excitement, um, anticipation, earnest expectation, until, until that character, which is key, can then express itself through this positive attitude about what, who God is and what he can do in our lives. That's the ultimate right there. There's something even greater than character, and it's hope. Okay, the hope that Bible, Scripture talks about, not wishful thinking hope, but earnest expectation hope, living expectantly hope. So, our, and here's how Paul describes in this passage what happened in the deepest place of his life to where he was able to transition from a sentence of death and despair over to an exuberant attitude of God delivering us and continuing to deliver us and the hope that he's expressing there. The key was, of course, through the lens of his belief system that God is a God, not just an ethereal God, but a God who raises the dead, that God. He learned in that moment of hardship not to rely upon himself but upon God who raises the dead. He shifted his weight from himself to a God who raises people from the dead and put all his eggs in that basket through this experience. And as a result of that shift, this almost sounds like it just, well, this happened. This, this is a powerful statement, but this happened that we might not rely upon ourselves, but on God. In fact, that whole word meaning there is about, is about a transfer of weight. Um, in fact, Proverbs chapter 3, verse 5 and, five and 6, um, trust the Lord with all your heart. The opposite, lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him and he will direct your path. So the trust that Paul's describing here is a putting all his weight on God and what God can do in his life. And that was a transition that expressed itself in a positive attitude. Tracy? So chronologic, chronologically, when was this written? Was this written after he'd been stoned to death, probably? Yeah, I think so, yes. 
gone through a lot of the experiences that are described in Acts at this point, yeah. So this isn't theory, this isn't something I think is the right thing to say or do. This is something he's experienced right. and is sharing his experience of who God is that regardless of the fact that we'll be threatened and we might fear death is imminent, is he's really saying, I've been raised from the dead by God and it's, it's okay. Paul's describing as a sentence of death, okay? But it can be any type of pressure, any kind of situation, any kind of circumstance. It's simply, we, in that moment, and only the Holy Spirit, only the Holy Spirit can, you know, I, you know our attitudes can change at a whim. Maybe a good sermon could change a belief system. Only the Holy Spirit can work down here. Only, only, the, only the Holy Spirit only can, can change and reformat us in the deeper structure of our lives. So our whole view of the world changes because we have a completely different perspective on who God is and how he's working in our lives. And that's an experiential phenomenon. That's not just reading a good book, okay? That's something where we go through something. And, and, but I think often when we reflect upon things that we've gone through, there can be a revisiting and, and the work that God was doing can, can become a revelation in our heart from the past brought into the present. That, that what God, it doesn't mean, you know, okay, now, now I, get to, I have to go through something really, really hard in 2020 to rely on God. No, I think there's things in our past that we've gone through that God can release the revelation that he intended through that experience, and we can get that through the Holy Spirit, and we can open our hearts to it and say, wow. I'm going to put all of my eggs in God's basket. I'm going to move all the chips on the table, and I'm going to bet that God's going to come through for me, and I'm not just going to sit back and kind of complain about it. I'm going to get really excited about it because character produces and releases hope. And hope does not cause us to be ashamed, Paul continues in Romans 5, because somehow during this process, it says the love of God has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit. His love just invades that whole journey and carries us through if we stay in his arms until that hope and exuberance and excitement is released from our lives. And that's my prayer for us for 2020. That what would happen, what would God do in our circumstances, in our lives, in the people's, people's lives around us, if we just live excited about what God is going to do this day? Something good is going to happen to me today. Wake up in the morning with that for breakfast. Have that with the espresso. Yeah. And God will do a good thing. It's because they, they learned that they could rely on God because they knew how faithful he was already. He'd shown himself faithful to them over and over and over again. So they knew they could rely on the one who raised That's us right. the dead. So if we keep remembering his faithfulness, like you said, then we can have that hope and expectancy that he'll do it again. And that's the importance of testimony. That's yeah. the importance yeah. of what Pastor Tanya and David shared. Yes. I, need, I need to hear that. Right, right, exactly. You, we, need, we need the testimony. Whenever something you've seen God work in your life, and you, you know that was, boy, that was not just providence. Well, it probably was God, big P, providence, that God was at work, this, but this happened. <laughs> when something happens, share it with us, because um, it really is prophetic. It just ignites the same to happen in our lives, yeah. I think it reminds me of that we are in a partnership with God, and I, and I, I can't remember the person that had this quote, but said that... Um, forget how it goes exactly um, without him we can't and without without us he won't <laughs> so that's that's the thing is that we find out that we're in partnership and as in verse 9 it isn't even about us 
You know, it's, right. it's not about what we are doing. He's going to do it. Right. He's right. going to partner with us to do it. But we're not the one that's doing it. He is. Right. That's right. That's right. He's doing it. Good. Yeah. Any other, any other comments? Just. I think about forgetting what lies behind. There's a, a few of us that have, like, incredible memory. <laughs> so we have library card catalogs, if you're old enough to remember those library card catalogs. Yes, I remember. Of all the times the prayers didn't work, or you had faith, or you had expectancy, or something. So when you first started, right. Perry, I felt like the Lord whispered to my heart, expectancy was stolen from you in your childhood. Because people are always saying, oh, aren't you excited you're going to Wales, or aren't you excited about this? And I always say, no, I don't get excited about anything. But part of it, so it's kind of having a bonfire of the library, uh, with apologies to our beloved Sophia, it's a bonfire of library card catalogs of history where they're all, you know, Abraham contrary to hope. You know, at some point, Abraham had to burn up his card catalog of every single time expectancy was unmet. So, yeah. And since we're talking about libraries, <laughs> and we don't use the card catalog anymore, we've gone to the digital age, which makes things more discoverable. So now we can discover more in the word if we, if we get rid of the old. And that hope and expectancy because he wants us to be like little children, and that's how they are. They're excited about things to come because they haven't been dashed. Their hopes haven't been dashed before, and we're to be like that. Yeah. I keep on getting a picture of a three-legged race. Is Papa wants us in a three-legged race with him, and we're just to come up, and he's going to basically carry us and run with us. But we, like Reuben says, we choose to run with him or not. So remember not the former things, nor consider the things of old. Burn up the card catalog. I love that. Isn't that great? It's telling us to burn up the card catalog. Behold, open your eyes, see this. I am doing a new thing. Now it springs forth. Do you not perceive it? I will make a way in the wilderness, rivers in the desert. And it goes on to express other blessings there in Isaiah chapter 43. So remember not, constantly um, told in Scripture to forget things that are, that are ugly, but remember the good things God has done. Recall those things. Build, literally build a memorial in your mind of what God has done that, um, that needs to continue to encourage you. So, so good stuff. So are we going we gonna to learn to live... Where is it here? Oh, skip Leo. Okay, there we go. A tiptoe. You got your new vocabulary word for 2020. A tiptoe. Did you find it in the dictionary? Oh, good, good. I feel better. I, what? Well, I didn't know if I could trust Facebook or not, so... Yes. Um, don't forget the, um, the Hebrew calendar. The Lord speaks, you know, to this time and seasons. And so the last 10 years were, do you see what that I'm going to do? Do you see what I'm going to do? Do you believe it? Do you see? And now we're stepping into, we will taste and see. We need to speak it and taste and see because you will taste and see. And that's this whole new 10, 10 years. Right, right. Move from seeing to taste and see, experience. Yeah, let it come to pass. All right, well, good deal. Yes, David, go ahead. I like, what, I like that about um, what you said, what you just said about just for, forget not the good things, but just forget about the bad things. And I think it's, 
And uh, Fawn kind of whispered in my ear, it's really hard to do when you have a good memory. And that got me thinking. Yeah. And that's kind of a dangerous thing these days, but it's okay. God usually works it out. So I was thinking it's kind of like you, you're, all the experiences of your life are in like, I don't know, I get the idea, I get the image of um, like soup plantations, salad bar. And I'm a pretty picky eater. I don't like a, lo a whole lot on my salad. I'm not like the adventurous type that will put cherries and half of the stuff that they have there. I'm just kind of like, I like lettuce. I like sunflower seeds and ranch dressing, and that's about it. But it's kind of like you've, it's, you, you've, you've got to make the choice. You've got to, you've got to consider what's valuable to you. And you've got to consider consider the things that God, the good things that God has done for you, uh, to be more valuable and indeed preferable to the things that, yeah, they happened and yeah, they hurt, but this is way better. And it's a, and it's it's not it's not easy, but once you once you kind of figure out what you like and what your what is preferable to you, what you decide is preferable to you. It's a willful it's a willful choice. Like I have to willfully decide to pick romaine lettuce instead of iceberg lettuce, even though I'm really used to iceberg lettuce. I know that this is better for me. I'm, I'm, I'll get there eventually. <laughs> but it's, it's once you, once you get, get into the habit of it, you almost, you almost don't even see the things that you don't want in the buffet anymore. So you, learned, you, learned to, you learned to ignore, ignore things that, that God is better than. And I think that's the that's the process of it. Yeah, it doesn't have to happen immediately, but but you working with God to establish what is preferable to you according to God, who wants the best for you in the first place anyway. So yeah, that's good. It's a that's a renewing of the mind that you're talking about there, David. And uh, obviously, beyond just romaine lettuce versus iceberg, which not a bad idea though um it replies to s <laughs> and and when you get to the romaine well then pretty soon you're gonna you're gonna look at that you're gonna look at that spinach you know and you're gonna you're uh, keel uh, now that's that kale i'm sorry keel that's a kale no that's that's pressing it just a little too far What's that next year? Yeah, 2021, we'll, we'll get to the kale stage. <laughs> okay, well, I don't want to hold you guys. So let me just speak this over you uh, slowly here um, and just let, let the words Hebrew and English just kind of soak in here. Yevarekha Adonai, Veish Mereka, the Lord bless you and keep you. Yair. Adonai, Panav, Eleka, Vikuneka. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. You saw Adonai, Panav, Eleka. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you. Beyasem Leka Shalom and give you peace. That's 2021. No, I'm getting there. I'm getting there. I'm I'm I, I'm I'm work, I'm gonna work I'm gonna work on the song. I said I was gonna sing it, and I'm eventually gonna sing it. So don't worry. Yeah, that song is gonna that I'm gonna get that Lisa anointing, and I'm just gonna let that Hebrew priestly blessing come forth in Hebrew sung. All right. So anyway, anyway, God bless, guys. Um, we've done the offering. Unless you still need to do that, I'll be glad. We're glad to pick that up. And let's remember the chairs. Thanks for coming. Have a great last few days of 2019. We'll see you in 2020, if not sooner. Yeah.